Welcome back. We're turning now to the latest news over tensions on the Korean Peninsula. After the DPRK performed another missile test, the U.S. tested its controversial missile defense system located in the Republic of Korea or South Korea. Joining us for this part of the show, Wang Guan is chief political correspondent for CGTN's Mandarin Service. And from Massachusetts, Myung Koo Kang is a professor of political science at Baruch College at the City University of New York. Thanks to both of you for joining us, Wang Guan. Let's talk about the Korean Peninsula. So, another successful intercontinental ballistic missile test. The U.S. carries out exercises with South Korea. We have the Chinese saying we need to calm down, get this resolved. And we have the South Korean president, the new South Korean president, who is saying he's open to dialogue. Lots of moving parts. Where does this stand right now? Well, you know, uh, China, in fact, has been doing quite a bit. Uh, we don't see that from President Trump's tweet when President Trump said uh, we're done working with China because China's trade with North Korea increased by 10 percent in the first half of the year. But uh, I, I do think that, that that interpretation is misguided in, to some extent, because if you look at the data, yes, the overall trade between China and North Korea increased by 10 percent. But import, uh, the Chinese import of North Korean goods actually decreased 13 percent. And uh, also, if you break that down by period, um, in terms of trade with uh, North Korea, China increased uh, and imported and exported much less after the February 18th UN resolution. Uh, China's uh, export to North Korea decreased three months in a row uh, from April through June. So China has been doing its part in implementing United Nations Security Council resolutions. And uh, to some extent, it has been working with the US and uh, its counterparts uh, in the region to, uh, you know, uh, pressure North Korea to uh, abandon this program. Right. The implication, Wang Guan, when President Trump said that trade had increased by 40 percent, the implication was that China can actually uh, do something, impose more sanctions, stop imports, uh, whereas that f the figure you point out is not correct. Well, um, the 40 percent figure. Well, when you say one thing, you've got to say the other. Uh, yeah. Of course, the overall trade, uh, China's export to North Korea increased about 30, 40 percent. Mm -hmm but its import from North Korea actually yeah. decreased. And then when you, de when you decrease the import of, for example, coal by 75 percent, right. that's basically killing the, lively, uh, the life livelihood of uh, the North Koreans. Its right. planes cannot take off, its trains cannot run, and there's a fuel crisis, if you remember, uh, back a month ago. Okay. Let's go to Myung in Massachusetts. Myung, uh, we have President Moon Jae-in, who is talking about dialogue, is talking about being more open to the DPRK. Uh, right. He's willing to talk even with uh, Kim Jong Un. Uh, how would that work? How is that? Uh, what is the plan here? Uh, his basic uh, approach is that you know, allying, you know, co closely cooperating with the United States, but at the same time, he wanted to strengthen inter Korean dialogues. But uh, one of the fundamental assumptions, as far as I understand, you know, South Korean government's assumption is that non political non-military issues, so relatively easy, for instance, a family reunion or inviting North Korea to participate in the Winter Olympics. So relatively not, you know, not that critical, strategically important issues, and then building some confidence or trust between the two Koreas. So the basic assumption is that some sort of, you know, spilling over uh, effects based on some uh, non-critical, you know, more interactions or cooperations. But the thing is that the North Korean government and Kim Jong-un regime basically thinks that the nuclear program or missile program is basically non-negotiable, non you know, uh, uh, non-negotiable issue. So I think the effectiveness of uh, South Korean Moon Jae-in government's approach uh, st strengthening inter-Korean dialogue may not be so fruitful in the near future. So those confidence-building measures that you were talking about, Myung, would they extend to something which existed between the two Koreas, and that is what was known as the sunshine policy, where there were uh, trading areas, there were industrial areas, which were common to both countries? Right. So the thing is that during the sunshine you know, policy period, especially uh, Kim Dae-jung government and Ro Muyen government, it lasted about 10 years, but it did not actually you know, contribute in terms of... Uh, persuading the North Korean regime to give up is a nuclear program or missile, you know, uh, program. Uh, what, what, another thing, what we have to uh, pay attention to the change, significant change, after the Kim Jong-un regime is the constitutional revision happened in 2014. 
So the Kim Jong regime made it quite clear in the constitution that North Korea will be a nuclear, uh, nuclear armed country in the future. And also, you know, North Korean uh, Workers Party party platform made it quite clear that North Korea is uh, building a, a nuclear armed, you know, strong, uh, great power in the future. So in terms of understanding this, you know, security related issue, North Korean regime would not give up is a nuclear missile program in exchange for some you know, trivial or minor economic benefit or some sort of uh, uh, so-called, you know, uh, carrots provided by the South Korean government. Wang Guan, what is the Chinese approach to defusing tensions on the Korean peninsula? Um, what would China like to see? Of course, there's another spanner in the works here, and that is the U.S. decision to deploy the anti-missile system, THAAD, in South Korea, which is opposed by China. So what happens next? Well, here uh, the, in Washington and across capitalists in the Western world, the narrative is that uh, when can China do enough to uh, pressure its ally, North Korea, to stop its weapons program? But I, I'm not sure that's the, the, the correct question to ask. I mean, uh, China has its own national interest. If mm -hmm. the North Korean regime, uh, the government collapsed, um, you know, there would be a, an estimate of uh, one million refugees flooding into the Chinese borders, you know, Dandong, Yanji, I've been to those provinces. Those are struggling Chinese cities by and of themselves and, you know, struggling to restructure its economy. So it will be a burden. And also, um, if the, the regime did collapse, that let's say um, there would be an increase in the U.S. military presence along the Chinese border, and then China might have to feel obliged to counter that by boosting its own military deterrent along the border. And then, um, the, you know, the U.S. Has not, always, has not always been acting as a friendly force, if right. you think about what's happening south in the East China Sea. So, Okay, Wang Guan, I want to make a sharp turn in the discussion right now, uh, go around the corner and talk about U.S.-China relations. There's a big meeting coming up. It's the economic dialogue. What can we expect? Well, I think there's a lot uh, on, the, um, on the agenda of both sides. Uh, we see some moves in this 100-day plan, uh, the economic plan heralded by President Xi and President Trump, uh, China reopened its market to import U.S. beef, and also China opened its market for uh, certain financial products. For example, the credit card companies in the U.S. are, uh, you know, conditionally allowed to go back to the United States, go back to Chinese market. But also, China has its own concern. For example, the high-tech export. Uh, U.S. cannot even export, for example, the, the bricks of a car to China because uh, it, it, it thinks it can be for dual use, military and civilian use. So those kind of issues that uh, is of Chinese concern, but uh, China feels it has not been adequately addressed. And I think that would be a perfect occasion for uh, Vice Premier Wang Yang and the U.S. Secretary of Commerce and Secretary of Treasury yeah. to sit down and have those talks to resolve those issues. You know, we had the 100-day uh, trade plan that was uh, tabled and agreed to at the Maui Lago, uh, Maui Lago Summit uh, in Florida. Um, what is the status of that? What impact does it have? Well, I think that really um, charted the course um, of this bilateral relationship. Where do they want this relationship to go? and uh, to create a very, uh, let's say, cordial relationship between right. the two leaders and also uh, four mechanisms, people-to-people uh, -people exchange, law enforcement, cybersecurity, and also diplomatic and economic dialogues. Uh, those are uh, interpreted as all-encompassing, uh, more comprehensive than the previous uh, two dialogue mechanisms. Now we have four dialogue mechanisms, right. and now we seem to have a, a two presidents who genuinely like each other. Okay, before we go on, get uh, Myung's view on this relationship between China and the United States. Uh, Myung, there were very harsh words uh, from Donald Trump, again, during the election campaign, uh, accusing right. China of all kinds of malfeasance, of uh, manipulating its currency, of, of dumping, uh, of unfair trade practices. Uh, has he softened his tone now? So the thing is that, uh, you know, right now, the U.S. government pressured upon the South Korean government that uh, it will renegotiate the U.S.-South Korean free trade agreement, mm -hmm. but what we have to focus, uh, what we have to understand is some specific, right. unique security and economic linkage pattern going on in East Asia. Uh, for instance, uh, in terms of, you know, economic relationship, regional comprehensive economic partnership, RCEP, Very quickly, Myung, you know, I've got 20 seconds. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay. So the thing is that China is the number one trading partner to South Korea and then to, uh, to other Asian economies, China is the most important economy right now. 
So in terms of strategic point of view, if U.S. United States try to pressure against other Asian countries or even to China, if that's the case, it will create a kind of more regional cooperation or intra-regional trade or economic cooperation in Asia. I think that would be the case. Okay, Myung Ku Kang, Wang Guan in the studio. Thanks to both of you for joining us. That's all we have time for. I'm Anand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.